is Reason Revolution. I'm your host, Justin Clark. Thank you so much for joining us this week. This week, I have my first conversation in a very, very long time. As those of you who, who may know, um, that we've really changed Reason Revolution within the last few months. Um, it went away from just being a weekly podcast to now an online media website with articles and, and lectures and all kinds of different content that we're creating for you. But we're still going to do the occasional podcast every once or once a month or so. Um, and this is our newest podcast in that sort of string of, of sort of uh, one-offs of conversations with people I'm really interested in hearing their perspectives. And the person I'll be speaking with uh, tonight as an author, she's an activist, and she is currently a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech, which is pretty cool. Um, as someone who just finished graduate school myself, I really understand how much uh, how difficult that is and how important that is. Um, but I'm really excited to have her on the podcast to share her perspective. Hypatia Alexandria, how's it going? Oh, I'm very well. Thank you. I um, uh, appreciate the fact that uh, you asked me to participate in this uh, uh, podcast. And just one quick correction, because I don't want anybody to say that I'm lying since we live in these very difficult times. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm a PhD student. I'm not quite a candidate yet. No, oh, that. Okay. But, uh, you know, I'm still not quite there. Okay, okay. I had to, you know, it's so funny in terms of like credentials and things. I had a previous podcast guest, Sarah Nicholson, and she is an um, an engineer in training up in in Canada. I said, well, how do I describe you? And she said, well, you have to say this very specific thing that relates to the field or whatever. So I totally understand. My apologies. Uh, thank you for the correction. And uh, I'm really looking forward to have our chat. So um, I guess my first question for you is, um, what's your background? Um, what was your upbringing like? And sort of what led you from uh, sort of your, your upbringing to where you are now and sort of your path to atheism and secular humanism? Well, I, I guess the answer is a two-component answer. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm the proud product and of an all-girls uh, Catholic school. The problem is that, well, not a problem. The thing is that I was never brainwashed as they wish they could have brainwashed me because I think I kind of was born like this. Uh, this is not <laughs> something that I that I worked very hard on it. I've, I've, I've always been a skeptic or what many people, especially in today's society, calls a contrarian, because if you don't agree with the mass, with the masses and the majority, you are always negative, contrarian, um, disgruntled, you know, all kind of uh, negative names just because you are not a follower. And fortunately for me and unfortunately for some people, I have never been a follower. So um, since my time uh, with the, uh, in, in, in school with nuns and very strict Italian nuns, I've been uh, an atheist. I question religion since I could open my mouth. But the first, I think the first six years or so, I, I wanted to believe so bad. And, and, I, and I remember as a little, little kid, not... I cannot say that I remember every little detail, but I do remember a very specific detail when I was around eight years old. I went to a church and I was opening all doors because it was late at night and I was with a cousin and we were kind of playing in the church and I was opening all the doors. And I always thought that if I opened the next door, I was going to be able to see this God that they were always talking to me about. So I looked everywhere. I searched everywhere. And I never saw anything. And I think that was the first kind of uh, uh, actual realization that that God that they were always talking to me about wasn't really there. So as I grew, I grew older, uh, I became more doubtful. I did have my uh, first communion. I did, co uh, I did my confirmation, but it was never with a religious meaning. Uh, it was always with, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have a party. That's so great. You know, people are going to come. We're going to have a party. I'm going to get presents. I'm going to be dressed in this new dress in this, you know, that sort of thing. It never had the meaning that it had for like for other girls of my age that they really felt part of something or uh, embedded in something. To me, it was more like, you know, another thing that I was expected to do. And the, the gratification for me was the party and the new dress and the presents and, and a good time in general. So then when I continue um, 
in the same uh, all girls school um, in high school, I remember we used to have religion classes every other day, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And one time, um, the nun was talking to us about the uh, uh, Eve and the apple and the snake and the this and the that. And she was going all, you know, happy about it. And I went like, kind of like, sure, yeah. And so she slapped me so bad that, (laughs) you know, I'm going, done. This is it. If you ever expect me to cross this this line, this is it. So from that time on, I never had had I never took ownership of the word atheism. But I remember talking to some of my friends and saying, you know, that's a that's a psychological crutch because if you don't have that, you can't you can't you don't have any other support. And I was, but they were very light conversations because I wasn't really thinking atheist, non-atheist. I was just thinking, this is stupid. Why are they telling me all this? Why are they talking to me about something that I cannot see, I cannot touch? I was always very much in, if you if you believe in it, if you can see it. Now, of course, there are many things in life that you, you cannot see and they are proven that they exist. But in this case, no one proved to me that this kind of imaginary friend existed. So um, I, I always kind of continue my life by thinking, nah, this is not, this is not who I am. And again, trying to minimize the contrarian part to a minimum, you kind of remain silent. You ca- I, I was kind of angry though, because I was so sick and tired of listening to the amen, the get up, uh, kneel down and, you know, do this, do that. And, uh, you know, I never, I had such a horrible time when I did my confirmation because I couldn't understand why a human being just like me had the power to forgive my quote unquote sins. First, first of all, I didn't have that many sins because I was, you know, kind of a good Catholic girl. So, um, there wasn't anything in my life that I that I felt that I had to apologize for that I that I had to uh, uh, ask for forgiveness. However, you know, also I had this thing: why is this man forgiving me for something that he's telling me is bad? You know, so it was always a very um, it was always a very difficult thing for me because I couldn't um, I couldn't. Uh, understand why I had to put up with so many uh, demands uh, that I didn't have any evidence for because there were demands. They were, this is the way it is. And that's all there is to it. It wasn't anything. Well, you know, yeah, you said this, but you know what? I found out that, or this is not the way I think it was always, this is the way we do it. We are Catholic and that's it. So Mm -hmm. that's pretty much the way I, uh, so, you know, I've, I, although I didn't call my myself an atheist, I was never a believer and I was never able to either let other people brainwash me or self brainwash. I could never do that. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much the same way. I mean, I, I grew up in the American Midwest. I, I live here in Indiana and, you know, I, I, religion didn't mean all that much to me growing up. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't grew up with a set with a with a religious background my parents they weren't atheists but they were but they were non-religious they didn't they didn't go to church i i can count on maybe one hand the amount of times i've been to church for religious purposes and and you know i, I always was sort of a natural skeptic natural sort of questioner and I, and i never really got it and and honestly I, I you know i would have become sort of an out atheist much earlier had it been for the knowledge of that right and right. And, and so you know i think it's interesting how you know, some of us, and, and, and I feel a kinship about this with you on this level, is that some of us are just sort of naturally, I think, intuitively um, skeptical. And, and, and you know, and I think for others, it's it's a little bit harder for them to get there. And But one thing that underlies, I think, your, your story so far that I think is super interesting, and it ties in to this excellent chapter you've written for um, a new book that um, Karen Garst of... Um, uh, women Beyond Belief um, is putting out. The book is called um, Women Versus Religion, The Case for Faith, 
the case against faith, rather, sorry, and for freedom, the case against faith and for freedom. And your chapter is called Why Hispanic Women Should Abandon Religion. And one of the key themes that comes through your chapter, and it's the one that I think uh, makes sense given your background and given what you've told me, um, is is education and the importance of education in uh, cultivating your critical thinking and skepticism in kids so that they can sort of develop the skills they need to not only sort of let you sort of leave superstitions behind, but also to, um, you know, compete and participate in the modern economy. So I guess that's really my first thing I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is why, what was it about education that was such a, a strong theme for you? Was it because of your upbringing or was, a, a, and if so, like, what was it about that upbringing that encouraged you to say, no, I think it's very important that we, we advocate for um, secular education? Well, I, I think I, I need to, tr- I'm going to try to make it short, but I think I never liked the place where I lived as a kid. Uh, because I thought that many opportunities were taken away from me. It was a very small town in a third world country where the roles are prescribed from the moment that you are born, either as a boy or as a girl. And although I am a straight woman, you know, I don't think I should be limited, you know, by by uh, kind of uh, uh, guidelines that they come from before. I'm always the person that questions things. I'm always the person that will say why. And people get annoyed by me because I go, why? And I don't mean it to put it in a bad spot. I mean it because I really want to know why. The fact that you tell me that the sky is blue, I want to know why. I just don't want to know that it's blue. I can't see that. So... You know, when I was growing up, the many whys that I had, I was able to find the answer through reading or although I have become quite a lazy reader right now of of everything else that is not school related, but um, I was very much into reading. Um, My my parents, my mother was a a teacher, a um, um, elementary education teacher and my father was a mining engineer so but we lived in a very small town where I mean when I say lack of opportunities I really mean it I don't mean it well you know I couldn't go to ballet at three o'clock because there were other class at four o'clock that I didn't want to take there wasn't anything nothing <laughs> you know so but so my only thing for me my kind of the world that i could escape to was uh, reading and every time that i had a question i was fortunately fortunate enough that my parents they never censor any kind of reading i mean i i knew how babies were born when i was five years old it was never like the b word the c word the t word no it was but with names with a process and exactly how the way things happen so you know to me it wasn't it wasn't curiosity about uh, uh, um, that's that kind of question it was curiosity about how things uh, you know, how things end up being. So um, that allowed me to enjoy education and kind of in my mind, I never had a question that I should go to, that I should continue studying after high school. And a lot of the time when I, I make emphasis that I'm going back to PhD, I'm doing it by two reasons. Number one, if you want to do it, you should never wait that long because I waited too long and it's a bad thing because <laughs> now that I went back, I felt like the most stupid person in the class. It took me about a semester to get my brain going again. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's very important because generally speaking, Hispanics or Latinas are not that Cause, and I'm not going to say every single one because there is always an exception to the rule, but they don't, they're not concentrating on education. They're concentrating in getting a husband having kids and being the the, the, the the and having a family to me none of that was ever a goal but i can see and i see how it comes from within the latino community so that's why i try to um correct by you know by writing the, the, the this essay by talking about this because i think if latinas consider education as an option, uh, just like I'm not telling you dismiss the fact that you want to have a family. I'm just saying it is another option. It's all about options. So 
it's not an excuse to say, well, my mom was meant to be married with a baby. She wants to be a grandmother. I do not care. My question to you is, what do you want to do with your life? And if that's what makes you happy, you should do it. But if that doesn't make you happy, you shouldn't apologize because you want to go back to school because you want to get an education. So that's where it comes out in, in what I was trying to convey in, in my essay, that I think education is the only possible way that Latinas can come out of this sort of uh, um, uh, status quo that they have uh, they have given or it has been embedded in their brains. Yeah, and it seems to me like uh, from from what I've read and what you've discussed that, you know, that a lot of this ties back to the colonial nature of European powers in the 16th century, you know, coming to, you know, the new world and colonizing areas and sort of you know, Christianizing them or, 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 you know, sort of imbuing them with Catholicism as a, as a way of being able to sort of create some level of social control. And you sort of talk about how within uh, the, the broader sort of Hispanic or Latino community um, in, in Central and South America that, that in a lot of ways that these sort of religious, uh, colonial religious inclinations sort of breed hierarchies and the hierarchy sort of um, uh, sort of denigrate the chances of women. And so it's always sort of about men being sort of the strong providers, always being strong providers and women always sort of being the, the subservient and, and caring, you know, wives and then for mothers, for children and how that's sort of the dominant narrative. And, and what you're arguing is that, no, I think it's time that we get beyond that in some ways. And it's not any, there's nothing wrong with wanting a family or having children, but, but as you've said, it's about choice it's about freedom. And, you know, and I think that for a lot of people, um, one of the ways that you sort of uh, help do that is to um, pull people out of poverty. But as you've mentioned in your essay, um, there is unfortunately still a lot of inequality and a lot of poverty within the Latino community. And that it's very hard for communities which sort of have these sort of traditional hierarchies, right, to sort of think in new ways in order to, you know, get education, to, um, you know, take the leadership positions, to be politically active. And I guess, I guess my, my follow-up question would be then is what are, what are some of the ways in which you, do you think that religion and particularly we're, we're specifically, I think mostly talking about Christianity and Catholicism in the context of this essay, what do you think it has done beyond sort of what I've described to sort of um, hold the Latino community back? Well, I, I think what is holding many people back in the Latino community even today is the fact that this way to control people was so affected by the conquistadors that, you know, it kind of, you know, almost got embedded in the DNA. So even after almost 300 years of independence, you, you know, most people still have that in them. But but the thing is, is that they don't even acknowledge because the only way to deal with the problem is when you accept that you have a problem. But if you never accept how bad religion uh, influences your life or your way of thinking, there's no way for you to address and change that. And I think they were, like I said, you know, they were extremely, extremely, you know, uh, uh, successful in doing that. And how do we change that? I think at this point, the only way to do it is through education. And, um, you know, I mainly concentrate on Latinos in the U.S. because as I mentioned in the, in the essay, that has already been brought over here by the first, uh, f by, the, by the people that immigrate from their countries over here. That comes with them. They never address it, so it continues to, to be perpetuated in the family for generations to come. And that's what needs to change. Young yeah. Latinos, they have to be, they have to be exposed to the fact 
that that's not the only answer. That's not the only way of doing it. That the fact that they are Latinos doesn't mean that they cannot question or challenge that. Because, you know, I happen to be a believer that any culture should be challenged and you should keep what is good in a culture and get rid of what is bad in a culture. Not just because you tell me, well, that's my culture. So, well, that, 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 that's the sacred world. So I, I should go back to the end of the line. I never say, I never say anything again. So, I, I, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a very slow process because first you have to educate people to kind of open their, their eyes to additional ideas. And once you open their eyes to additional ideas, you can say, you know, listen, it is okay to question. It is okay to, you know, to say, I don't want to have a kid. I, I, I'm not going to end up by myself if I'm 20 years old and I'm not married. Now, granted that, that there's a huge difference between the higher, higher stratus of uh, Latinos and the lower one, there's a huge, huge gap. And the roles are even more, uh, uh, more, uh, how should I say, embedded the lower that you go in the economic uh, scale. So it is, it's, a, it's an economic, it's a and social problem. And on top of that, add education to it, and you end up with a very complex thing, and with some communities being very. Uh, not willing to trust anybody or anything, it's very difficult to get to them and 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 and, and explain to them that that's the uh, that, that you know that there are other ways to do things. For example, you know I've been asked to speak in some um, um, to some uh, Latin organizations, and when I they ask me to do that, I tell them very clearly, you know, I am not a religious person. Um, I will not be endorsing any type of religion in my presentation. And also, I believe that women and men should have equal access to opportunities. I don't say that men and women are the same because obviously, physically, we're not the same. Maybe uh, brain-wise, you know, I, I, I accept that. But physically, we're not the same. Uh, so, you know, once I get there, my first question is, do you have a daughter? You have a son. Now, if your son wants to spend the night, uh, wants to stay out of the house overnight, what happens? Or oh, nothing. What about your daughter? Oh, well, you know, the virginity, you know, the purity. And I'm going like, why? Why is there a different set of rules for girls versus boy boys? It should be the same. Because if you don't do that, then you get the so-called machismo. Who are you going to whine to about this machismo when you women are the one creating this? You know, and needless to say, I have not been asked to come back to many places because, you know, I say this and this this is something that kind of uh, um, doesn't go well with, uh, you know, women are subservient to men, men are the provider, you know, uh, you know, if, if a man has many women, it's glorious, but if, if, if a woman has many boyfriends, she's a whore, you know, it's, it's a totally, you know, different uh, set of values for according to gender, and I just don't agree with that, And but I've been very fortunate also that to meet other Latinas and I've had this conversation with them, and some of them, they told me that I was the first person that openly spoke with them about that, which I'm okay because somebody has to do the first, take the first step, and I don't have a problem doing that. But the fact that I'm doing this, that it doesn't mean that, it, that we are done, that it's taken care of, and it's being solved. This is just the beginning, and it's one person at a time, mm -hmm. one step at a time. It's going to be a long way, but I'm interested because, you know, that's the same thing that is holding down the Latino community in the United States. We're invisible. We're not civically engaged. We are discriminated and we take it. We take it with a smile. You know, I don't, but most people do. So, um, you know, I find that very, very discouraging because there are many, many Latinos that are hardworking people that, you know, they, they contribute to their, uh, to their family. They try to move their families out of their poverty. They have two, three jobs, but, you know, when the personal attacks or when, or when the ethnic attacks happen, 
they remain silent and these type of attacks never come out in the open. So they go like, well, you know, Latinos are taking, you know, the works from everybody else. You know, they come to this country and they take over, you know, and perhaps one in a million because there is good and bad people everywhere. But when we're talking about the majority, that's not the reality of things. So that's what I'm trying to change. And that's what I'm trying to explain that this is not something that we started thinking kind of like in the middle of the way. This is something that it was used against the Indians when the conquistadors came from Spain. And the easiest way to control the Indians was to, you know, to impose religion on them. And with religion became the tool, or the, 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 you know, the preferred tool of uh, 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 the control tool. So I think as a model, I think it's genius. Now, as one that has to suffer the consequences, it's not so genius. But, you know, uh, many times they go like, well, you know, uh, the, the Indians are uh, lazy, dirty, corrupt. And this, no, the Indians were very pure people. The corruption, the laziness, the, 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 the thinness, the, everything comes from, came from Europe with the Spaniards and the Portu uh, Portuguese people. Indians weren't like that, you know, they got corrupted and, you know, and I'm not trying to say, well, you know, I hate Spaniards because they, no, that's not the point. I'm just saying, don't blame the Indians because you're putting the blame in the wrong place. And I'm not trying to be uh, discriminated against Spanish people either, but that's the truth. They are mm -hmm. the ones that came with all these issues. The Indians didn't have those issues you know, when they came over, I, I, they were very proud people, but so in order to avoid fights and because there were not as many as Indians, the Spanish had to be, they had to find a way to control them. And it was genius. They found that religion could give them that power. And they, they you know, they, they, they started, you know, embedding this in the thought, in the culture, and they start assigning uh, 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 different different social classes. If you were European, you were the highest class. If you were mulatto, you were a little bit lower. If you were at the bottom, it was the Indian. So lowest Indian, highest European, and anybody in between was mixed one way or another. And you know, and and it was, and then they they introduced the divine right that the divine right always came by by kind of by birth was given to you by birth so the more european the that you that that you had in you the more power the more kind of quote unquote divine you were because you know it, it was given at birth so it, it was a genius thing for the conquistadors it wasn't so genius for us that we have to carry that that stuff or uh, you know with us for for until today, and it's been in the culture for so long that it's going to take us long to remove it. That it that it took to to embed it in the culture. Um, yeah. So one of the main things I think that's important when you're talking about how do we sort of change that is you sort of talk about how within the sort of broader Latino community there's this sort of um, sort of politics of fragmentation. Where you, where you sort of mentioned how a lot of people say, well, I'm Mexican or I'm Bolivian or I'm Ecuadorian or whatever. And you talk about how you know, the fragmentation uh, makes it difficult to reach out to large groups in the Hispanic community to work toward any sort of common goal, whether that's better political representation, improving educational statistics, or increasing awareness about problems related to birth and marriage rates. At the core mm -hmm. of all these issues is religion. The ability to unite to teach critical thinking skills would help Latinos start questioning whether religion actually makes our lives better. The point of teaching critical thinking skills is that each individual can come to the conclusion on their own on what to believe and what to dismiss. And, and, and I really like this part of your chapter because I think it's something that I speak about a lot. It's something I've spoken about on this show, mm -hmm. which is this notion of identity politics mm -hmm. and how, you know, some identity politics is good, that, that, that there is something inherently about identity that's a part of a political consciousness, right? So your background and your identity does play a big part in how you sort of view the world and how and how you are a political, um, a political citizen, right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, you talk about how this fragmentation can lead to a sort of splintering of goals and common and common um, uh, 
progress that we all seek to have at the expense of, you know, keeping these sort of shared identities and these sort of fragmented um, identities. Um, could you speak a little more to that and why you think that this sort of fragment sort of fragmented approach really harms um, the Latino uh, uh, community's ability to be more of a potent political force in the United States? Um, yeah, um, you know, men, most Latinos, they are very, very proud of stating their country of origin when it's the first generation, and that gets passed on onto their children, which continue calling themselves from that country as if they have been born in, those, in that country when actually they were born in the U.S. So I always, you know, I say many times that Latinos' worst enemies are Latinos, you know, and not people outside the, 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 the Latino community because we are so worried uh, 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 about glorifying the country of ancestry that we lose track of the bigger picture, which in this country is the fact that my, my goal here is that we are all Latinos. I really don't care what country you are from. And that's why when we started talking, I told you, you know, I don't carry the flag of any particular Latino country. The only flag that I carry is the flag of this country because I'm first and foremost an American and then I'm Hispanic and then everything else. But I never go to the point, oh, well, I'm from Argentina, I'm from Ecuador, because it does not bring anything to the conversation conversation except saying that my values are better than your values because I'm from this country instead of that that country and then that gets lost in translation and smart people knows that you conquer by division so if latinos are kept divided among themselves will never be amount to be that force that we should be where the biggest minority, the largest minority in this country, we lack representation, political representation, boardroom representation, uh, management representation at all kind of levels. But you know, how much can I blame that on the rest of the world without me looking at myself and saying, what is it that I'm doing wrong that I need to correct so this stops? You know. Now, in, in my particular case, there are several things. For example, many times I go to places, I'm a little bit taller than the average Latino. So they look at me and they don't know whether I'm Latino until I open my mouth and my accent comes out, but they don't know, am I, am I Latino? Am I Portuguese? Am I Middle Eastern? What am I? So, you know, I, 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 I can get away with, with certain things. And I also have credentials, which are, Credentials are something that people cannot take away from you, and, and and people cannot come to me and say, "Well, you know, you have, uh, uh, you have no education. You have uh, five, seven kids. You never be able to get out of the house because you're raising all those kids." So, I can see both sides of the fences, and that's why I understand that sometimes the stereotype is very hurtful. But until we, we meaning we Latinos, change that. Why should the rest of the world think of us as something different? You know, we are in a world that you have to you have to demand what you want because if you ask, they send you to the back of the line. And Latinos are very, very submissive because of this history that they have about being, uh, you know, conquered and then, you know, being under uh, a Spanish rule for so long and having this. Remember that when the United States, you know, they always look for independence from England, but for Latinos, it was a pride, it was a source of pride to say that they were related to the motherland, Spain. So it, 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 it it's very. It's, it's not the same. It, it wasn't the same situation, and even today, a little bit less than before. But even today, you go to some of these Latin countries, and they go, "Well, you know, I'm Spanish." Well, you are one tenth Spanish. Yeah, it is true that you are Spanish, but you are just one tenth. But you are still kind of hallucinating about the motherland, which has never given a damn about you. <laughs> so, you know, to me, it's very difficult to understand that. And, I, and again, that's where my kind of uh, um, uh, free thinking comes in because it's like, why do I have to 
you know, adore a country that never care about me as as a, as a, as, a, as a subject or individual or in any kind of way. Why do I have to do that? And that's why I, I think until we cure that part of the disease, we're never going to be able to, you know, to eradicate the disease. And it's still a long way. I think in the United States, because there are more opportunities, some Latinos can uh, grab the concept, can 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 agree with the with the idea a little bit more or faster than going back to Latin America. But again, my concern, truly, truly, is not Latin America because they have their own precedents. They are not being. Uh, isolated in a corner because there are bad hombres and then uh, uh, rapists and there are all sorts of things that is happening here. So my concern is with the Latino community in the United States. That's who most people, who most politicians are not looking after. You know, uh, one of uh, going to the jumping onto the political um, uh, subject a little bit. You know, my thing is like. It seems that every time they want votes, they come to the Latino community and in between, no. And they love the way the word diverse, I mean, diversity. But let me tell you, I can have a table with a Chinese, a black, an Asian, a transgender, and we're all diverse. But the moment that we get up from that table, we'll kill each other. To me, that has no value whatsoever. I'm for diversity and inclusion. I, I don't believe in the word diversity except for a photo op and just to say, oh, you know, I love you no matter what color you are. So I'm, my concern, again, is with the Latino community, and I'm always constantly trying to do things, trying to educate them. Critical thinking skills, I think, are, you know, very important and they should not be forgotten in any kind of way shape or form because if we don't if we don't uh, embrace and we don't promote those critical thinking skills nothing is going to change i think that's the that's at the at the core of the problem i mean that's that's just the main thing we need to address that we need to get more girls involved uh, uh, in STEMs and more girls involved in, in college period. You know, I, again, you know, I'm not judging if you want to be a mother, but you have to be a mother. You have to become a mother when you are ready emotionally, financially. It's not when your mother or your grandma is telling you that they want a grandkid. So there has to be this independent way of thinking where you are able to determine what is better for you know what is better for everyone else around you. And I think that's why sometimes the family word has tentacles that instead of helping some of us kind of, you know, help us stay down. And that's what needs to change. Yeah, for sure. And and I'm so glad that you switched to politics because I think this is a big part of your essay and a big part of where you and I are very much in agreement is that, um, you know, it's very easy to talk about, uh, you know, how awful Trump is. And he is. I mean, I, I, I did not vote for Trump. I don't support Trump. I think that, uh, you know, um, as somebody who is a lifelong sort of Democrat and I, you know, I worked on Obama's 2008 campaign and, and, and I voted for Bernie in the primary and voted for Clinton in the general. I, I don't feel like Trump represented America for me at all and and represented if anything he re he represented sort of a dark um sort of cynical and aggressive America that I thought we had largely left behind but you do I think in your in your chapter and I think this is very important is that you you highlight all of that I mean you you don't shy away from that but you're also fairly critical of the Democratic Party too and and, and the fact that they sort of talk about diversity but they don't really like you said, like you said, really give you a seat at the table to make lasting change. I, I just recently went to a lecture by Dr. Anthony Penn, um, who's an African American humanist scholar, and he made a point of um, real diversity, real change happens when those who have not been at the table get to be at the table, and uh, and the changes that happen are hard. They're not going to be easy. People who have had power for so long don't easily give it up. And, right. and, and so it's very hard for that system to work 
to make bring real legitimate change. I, I'm going to quote from your chapter again because I thought this quote was uh, really prescient. You said, the, the "Quote the, this lack of political inclusion of the Democratic Party only compounds the feeling of alienation that Latino women are already experiencing. We can continue waiting until changes occur on their own, or we can expedite the process by getting Latino women acclimated to the political system sooner rather than later." And I think this is really the choice here, right? So, you know, the Democratic Party in a lot of ways just sort of assumes that it's going to get. African-American voters sort of assumes it's going to get Latino voters. But as you make a point of in the chapter, like you know, Donald Trump got 25 percent of uh, Hispanic women in the 2016 election, which I'm almost fairly sure is higher than what Mitt Romney got in 2012. And I guess that makes me uh, I guess I have sort of two questions. One is, you know, why do you think so many Hispanic women and just Hispanics in general supported Trump more so than they did with Romney, even though he had the sort of really ugly div divisive rhetoric? And then on the other side of that coin, what do you think the Democratic Party could actually do to genuinely make the party more inclusive for Latinos? And if they can't do that, what should the Latino community do to sort of make the political system uh, uh, genuinely include them? Um, okay, so uh, you know, in this case, I can give you, I can use myself an example, and I know I'm going to get some, you know, uh, backlash for this because I'm very involved, uh, or, or I try to be very involved in politics at the local level, and you know, for the longest time, I've been trying to be included, and I am allowed to a certain point, and then that door closes. So my thing is, I have real issues. I think I have a different point of view to solve those issues. I think I can bring renewed interest to the party by allowing me to be part of that decision-making process as opposed to just an expectator. So for the life of me, I don't understand why they cannot or they will not carry this through the end. I've been very lucky lately of finding some people with kind, you know, like-minded that agree with me, but they still are not in a position to make these changes. But I can tell you that one time I called uh, the uh, Democratic Party, myself. This is my myself, um, and I wanted to. And I wanted to have. I, I was asking for for a question on how to do something. So the conversation moved a little bit away from that, and uh, I was really frustrated. So. I kind of made the comment, no wonder we've been losing elections for the, you know, we keep losing election after election after election. So the guy on the other end, he, part of the machinery, the democratic machinery that I call, uh, he was like, you can't say that we're very successful. You know, we won the election. And my answer to that is you, you did not win the elections. People are so frustrated that we change the outcome this time. But what is going to happen next time? You know, is the fact that Virginia went blue one time doesn't mean that it's going to continue going blue, especially when you are still not including people at the at the, at the making decision in the making decision process. Just saying that you like me doesn't make absolutely any difference. You have to include me. You have to put me in a position where I can offer my input and my input is considered in the final decision. And if you ask me for my opinion, you know, you need to follow up on what I told you. Just don't say, yeah, thank you very much. And I never hear from you again. And I think that's where the, the uh, Democratic Party has failed and what what we can do as 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 a community number one i think you know we need to um make a decision and actually vote for those candidates that are not against that are not voting against our own interest so if that candidate happens to be a republican or an independent well perhaps you know as much as the tradition it goes against tradition, Latinos are going to are going to have to vote for that person until some Democrats wake up and they realize that they can continue 
the status quo, that the, the way of doing business, they need to change. And, you know, I, I hear this time after time where we need to we need to reform the party. We need to do this. We need to do that. But nothing happens. And it's not happening just with Latinos. It's happening with black people. It's happening with white people. So obviously this is this is a problem in general, but it's is very much accentuated with Latinos because we don't have nearly, nearly any representation at all. So everybody making decisions about Latinos on Latinos issues are non Latinos. And I can guarantee you that there are many very well prepared Latinos willing and able to take part in those decisions but they're just not being allowed to do so. And you know, when you, when you ha like you said, it's very difficult for some people to give up power, but if they don't realize that that inability to give up, give up power might put them out of commission as a party altogether, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, my biggest problem with the Democrats and, and look, I, I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Democrat and Ben, there's nobody that I, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously being hyperbolic or just sort of kidding, but like, I don't know if there's anybody who's more of a critic of the party than me mm -hmm. in the sense that one of the things that bothers me a lot is that there's this weird thing that goes on with the Democratic Party where they sort of constantly talk about diversity and inclusion and this and that and the other, and they tend to be kind of great on some of the social issues, right? But that's all they sort of run on. Like, if you looked at the 2016 election, that's sort of all they ran on. Mm -hmm. And they just sort of assumed, like, African Americans will vote for us, Hispanics will vote for us, like, the demographics are there, we'll win. What they realized is that you need more than that, right? Because those things only unite us so much. There, there are things that are bigger about us as Americans that do unite us, you know, whether it's, you know, good schools and, uh, and, you know, affordable health care and, you know, living wages and, and health. things and health care. Exactly. You know, health care, you know, and, and things like that, that there are sort of bigger issues that the Democratic Party used to really have as their bread and butter, right? Like if you think of like the New Deal through, you know, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, if you think about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps, um, housing and urban development, all of these things that were done uh, to help people lift themselves out of poverty. And, you know, the Democratic Party used to be the party of regular people. It used to be the party of working people. And it, 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 it championed progress. It championed um, economic growth. It championed, um, you know, effective government action. And the thing that I've seen with the Democratic Party lately is that they really don't care to articulate a message about working people and they're trying to do they're trying to change that right if you look at somebody like randy bryce up in wisconsin who i think is doing so well in the polls on the democratic side that he sort of convinced paul ryan not to rerun because he's running for paul ryan's seat mm -hmm. uh so there's that i mean the the success you see with somebody like doug jones down in alabama the success of um the new uh governor of virginia is a great example or not virginia <laughs> yeah right yeah virginia um if you look at that, right? So they're, they're having a sort of economic middle class message, right? That that sort of unites people of all different backgrounds, you know, black, white, Hispanic, gay, transgender, whatever, you know, atheist, uh, religious, you know, th th there are sort of these broader issues about, you know, you know, uh, fair wages and good health care, good affordable health care and good education for the for our kids and for our, for our future. Like, those are things that people really care about. And the th and I just see sometimes the Democratic Party moves away from those things and it's to their detriment, right? Because the, the Republicans will come in and sort of try to do their own version of it and they win. And I just think that, you know, I'm not like a lot of people who think that identity politics is the worst thing in the world. I, I don't. What I think it is, is it has its limits. And I think that you know, a good message about fighting for, you know, uh, you know, typically marginalized groups uh, and fighting for their economic and social justice, right? Well, at the same time, having a message of, you know, economic and social justice that, that benefits everybody, that sort of appeals to everyone. Um, and that was something Obama was very good at. And, and you know, the policies didn't always match the rhetoric, but th that was something that was there. And that's something that distresses me about the Democratic Party. And I think it's a real, 
I think it's really um, naive to suggest that Latino voters will always be there for you because they won't. If you don't deliver, if you don't give them a seat at the table, if you don't genuinely involve them in the process, if you don't elect Latino candidates, they're not going to support you in the way that you think they will. And so that my hope is the Democratic Party will change. But the problem is, is that I think there's too much of a Democratic elite that won't allow for that, at least in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think that's the key uh, that you just mentioned, the elite. I mean, it's become like a quote unquote God given right that you are going to be the candidate, you mm -hmm. know, regardless of whether you represent the real, the values that people are looking to have represented or not. And I think that's that's the disconnect because, you know, I, I work for the, you know, in, in the last two elections, I knock doors and everything like that. And I told them, but of course I didn't tell the, the higher uh, Democrats, but I think they should have known this because it was happening in front of their noses. You know, I told them, you are losing a lot of Latino voters here. And it was like, it, like, I didn't know what I was saying. It's like, how can she say that again under the assumption, you know, we own Latino voters, we own black voters. So no matter what you or anybody says, we know we're going to get them. Well, they had a very rude awakening when things didn't go I think as expected, because to me, the fact that 30 percent, about 30 percent of Latinos went Republican in the last um, presidential election, you know, says a lot. Yeah. They are very, they are very disillusioned with everything. They are very, uh, uh, they are turned off by 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 the by what the Democrats, because you know what they say doesn't match their actions, and and I think. You know, when you start working, when you are working on creating free, uh, free thinking skills, that starts playing a role because I'm not saying that they are all geniuses now, but slowly and slowly they are going like, well, why are we the largest minority and don't have any representation? Why do they talk about diversity and we're not included? You know, and, and, and these are natural questions. And, and I think the sooner they are addressed, the better off that we're going to be in general because I think once any candidate becomes an elected official, you know, and they want to stay elected, they know that they have to govern for the majority, not for a particular group. So I don't think it's going to be like a, a, a terrible cultural shock to have more Latinos elected because ultimately, like you said, there are issues bigger than ethnicities that unite us all, you know, healthcare, uh, education, uh, you know, uh, fair pay, so many things that we can sit here that affects across the board, all communities, regardless of race or ethnicity or whatever. So I don't understand the worry of opening up the process for everybody rather than just for the elite, because, you know, sometimes I feel like we have like a, like a, 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 a monarchy uh, 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 in kind of like a, in a democracy because, you know, if you have this last name or if you've been elected for 25 million years, then for sure nobody should dare to, uh, you know, to challenge your, your, um, your uh, candidacy from the same party. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe you become too complacent. Maybe there is somebody better. Maybe there is somebody with another idea. Why not opening up the stuff for a fair for a fair race as opposed to you know by divine right and mm -hmm. that's that's where i think uh the democrats they need to change you know currently i'm working very very hard with the latino community here in northern virginia trying to get them involved civically involved and um, because you know even if they cannot vote there are many ways that we can support candidate that support or that will bring our issues, our questions to life and to the open. But if we remain silent people, like, you know, ghosts in the background, nothing is going to change. But it is very difficult because the current environment doesn't, doesn't encourage that. People are, uh, you know, Latinos, they have, uh, uh, they are, by nature, they tend not to trust people. And when, with all the stuff in the news that they get deported and this and that, it's very difficult to, you know, to uh, kind of get their attention in the political aspect. 
But, you know, right now, because at least I don't have uh, kids to take care of and I don't have anything except my school, I'm dedicating a lot of my time trying to get Latinos involved, especially where I live, because we lag behind even when you look at other neighboring counties. So um, hopefully it will make it a difference because I think if if you keep at it, you are, you might not see the results immediately, but they are going to start, going to come out sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, progress is often very slow and sometimes it's, you know, it's sort of two steps forward, one step back. And, and I think that we can't, get into a place where we think that, you know, everything will happen right away. I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I mean, let's, I mean, in reference to another, you know, sort of huge demographic of the country that doesn't always have representation, if you think of the religiously unaffiliated. So, you know, according to the Public Religion Research Institute, the PRRI, they put a, a study two years ago where they mentioned the fact that 25% of Americans, and this is a huge jump, at least within the last 20, 25 years, that 20 to about 25 percent of Americans are religiously unaffiliated. So, you know, I think according to another Gallup or Pew poll, I guess about 7 percent of that is atheist. Um, you know, a good chunk of it's agnostic or, or sort of free thinker, deist. I don't want to go to church on Sunday. I'm spiritual, but not religious. It's a huge group of people that are sort of religiously unaffiliated. And it's the largest growing religious demographic in the country. And I think we're second only to evangelicals in terms of a, a religious or sort of, you know, f- religious minority, or if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. And yet one thing that's very interesting is that uh, the PRR study also noted that like 12% of of sort of the, the nuns in that sort of category of 25%, 20,000, uh, 2016, that, you know, that group only really voted about 10 to 12% in the the 2012 election. I don't know what the dates are, the st- stats on the, the 2016 election. But but just think about that. So like you have a huge group of people who are religiously unaffiliated. It's atheists, agnostics, you know, free thinkers of, of many different stripes, the religiously unaffiliated. And they don't sort of assert themselves. Part of that is I think that they all have very differing views. But one thing that's been very promising is that Within the past week, we've seen um, the formation of a Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which I think is is excellent. And we've written about that on the website mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that four congressmen have come together to found this Free Thought Caucus. And we have secular organizations that are working towards that. Um, what do you think we can do as sort of secular voters to advocate for secular values and to become more of a part of the political process um, from that perspective. I think you've spoken very well about the, the issues with the, uh, the Latino community, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about the other part of that story, which is the religiously unaffiliated or atheists or free thinkers. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a very difficult question for me because it's, uh, the, I have so many what are considered not appealing uh, features within me. I'm a woman, I'm Latina, I'm atheist. I was like, why would you take me anywhere, you know? But, but, you know, having said that, I'm always trying to insert myself everywhere because, you know, first of all, because I went to to a Catholic school all my life, I feel very comfortable you know, uh, in, uh, with some religions, no, with all, I feel very comfortable with Christianity because it's w- w- is where I'm most familiar with. Not to say that I I I I, I feel any weird way with other religions, but I'm just saying I I, I don't have any problem in, in in being around them and even working with them. Sometimes, you know, partnerships might take the secular values all the way to the top. There are uh, groups like the groups of separation of uh, religion and government, you know, where rather than talking about uh, talking about religion, you're talking about secular values. That's a, it's a good way to, to move the secular movement forward. And, uh, you know, and that's something that I work, uh, that, I, that I'm in, involved with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of some secular groups and I'm trying to, help set up secular caucuses and and, and all that. And, and I think even though we have to navigate a very precarious uh, path between not falling into religious fight and, and, and keeping the secular values in front of us or more than secular values, the separation 
separation of uh, uh, religion and government, you know, uh, uh, very clear as a goal. Um, I think, um, you know, that's the way to move non-believers or nuns or uh, non, non-religious people values ahead. You know, we, we have to be able to find the common denominator with other groups so we can move forward with, with, with you know, within those, um, within those uh, values. Um, it is very difficult because, you know, people, although I've been accused of being a militant atheist, I don't think of myself as a militant atheist. First of all, I don't march in any parade. So that's <laughs> the first thing. Uh, that's what I don't think myself as a, as a militant atheist, but but uh, but I also believe that atheism is not what makes me. I'm a very complex person. I'm worried about politics. I'm worried about inequality. I'm worried about women values. I'm 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 worried about women opportunities, education, many things. And atheism is a very important part, but it's not the only part. So mm-hmm. we can put if we can put it in perspective and if we can give it a common denominator, because I will never go to a place and lie to somebody intentionally and say, yes, I'm a Catholic. So you look at me in a different way or you allow me to, to be, to, to, to get ahead in any kind of way, shape or form. I'm not also going to go, I'm not going to go to a place and say, you know, you can't do this because my values are better than you. All I say, my philosophy is if you are against abortion don't have one mm-hmm. if, if you don't like uh lesbians and gays don't be with one but don't tell me that i cannot be one you know don't don't dictate what i can be or not be because you think those are your values so you know navigating through all those different opinions and and different um way of thinking is very difficult, but if we find a common denominator, even if it might be a weak one, you know, I think that will help us uh, get ahead in in, in getting, you know, this movement. I just wish I could, I didn't have to call it one way or another because I call it like a rational movement. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's nothing rational about being a religious fanatic. There's nothing, you know, I just attended um, a gala and I thought somebody should have told me that this was going to be a revival because if I had known that, I would have paid the money that I paid. You, you, you know, for example, you know, to me, this organiz- some organizations, they need to stop ambushing people. I, if you are going to have a, a, a revival style gala, please let me know so I can choose accordingly. But just... You know, once I get there and you collect my money and you attack me with all this religious stuff, that really makes me angry. And I think that's when if we had, you know, because this has been in some kind of, uh, not totally, but kind of government events. So, you know, if we start with separation of uh, government and religion, I think that would be that would be a good place to start. And then, you know, we can, be, then if we can, have religion to become so irrelevant that people doesn't just care about it. You know, I'm not saying that maybe I like a red dress. Maybe I call my red dress a religion, but should I stop liking my red dress because you call it a religion? No, but the same thing is you shouldn't impose the red dress on me because you like it. So, but if we make the color of the dress irrelevant, then we can use the same analogy for religion. And once religion becomes irrelevant, we wouldn't even have this conversation. We wouldn't even have to be going through all this kind of, how do we move the movement ahead? What can we do to, to get our secular values, you know, up front? You know, we, we also have a long way to go in this. And sometimes I feel very discouraged because what do I pick? Woman, Latina or atheist? What else can I be? You know that I, I, I'm not going to have some, some, you know, opposition and some traction and some heavy opposition moving forward. I mean, you know, I have to navigate because it, the assumption is, oh, she's Hispanic, oh, so she's Catholic. No, I'm not. You know, oh, well, she's a woman. Uh, so uh, you know, predetermined stereotypes. 
it's just extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in situations where other women really annoy me. White women. Some white women are really annoying. <laughs> to tell me, well, why are you complaining about discrimination? We've been discriminating at women. Listen, don't you ever talk about discrimination <laughs> Blacks and Latinos, if you are a white person, because I don't care how much discrimination you have suffered, it has never compared to any amount to the way Latinos and black people have suffered discrimination, because even though all kind of people and there is all kind of discrimination, the strongest discrimination has been suffered by black and Latinos. It hasn't been suffered by, by white women or by women being white. No, that's that might be a little bit, but it's nothing compared to that. And when you haven't experienced the hardship of being black or being Latina, you can't speak about suffering, about being a white discriminated woman. So, you yeah, know. I, I, that seems very ignorant to me uh, that they would say something like that. But it speaks volumes about the fact that, you know, sort of what we've discussed earlier, that like if you're not legitimately at the table, right, if you're not actually – you know, if you're actually being a part of the process that changes things, then people will ignore you or people will forget you. And, and that sort of a, not allows them, but it sort of gives them the sort of out to be ignorant in that way. And, and I think that's just crazy to me. Um, and the one other thing I guess I just wanted to mention, too, is is the fact that I agree with you about sort of the irrelevance of it. Right. So I always say that I hope for a world in which religion is one if not all three things, benevolent, irrelevant, or non-existent. Benevolent in the sense that it's gotten nice enough that it's not about, you know, persecuting gay people and women who choose to have abortions. And religion for people is sort of getting together and having a nice time and maybe doing some charity work and things like that, as long as they don't press their views on other people. Right. I'm fine with that. The second one is irrelevant, where, you know, people sort of hear whatever, you know, whatever sort of Christian pastor says some crazy bullshit or some, you know, Islamic imam says some crazy bullshit and people just go, ah, pff, that's ridiculous. We don't we don't need to listen to that crap. Then then we've succeeded on that level. And the third one is non-existent, where people just sort of let it go and they have no interest in it anymore. And I am with you on one other thing, which is that you said sort of you sort of said the atheism is only a part of me. And, and I totally agree. I mean, I, I you know, I uh, as I've gotten older, you know, atheism does tell you what I'm not. But secular humanism sort of tells you what I am. And I sort of try to articulate what secular human is to people and, and, and what being a secular humanist is. And, 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 I, and I go back and forth about when I talk about myself to people, you know, what are you or whatever? Should I lead with atheists? Should I lead with humanists? I sort of just say I'm a secular humanist. And if they want to get in more detail, I tell them I'm an atheist or I just tell them I'm non-religious. Um, but I think as I get older... And I think I'm just way more interested in sort of building bridges and sort of finding where we can have common ground and and trying to do the right thing. Because I, I've, met, I've met a lot of people, religious and non-religious alike, who do uh, advocate for human rights, who do want a strong separation of church and state. Because they know that if you have a strong separation of church and state, that you get to be left alone. There's a, there's a certain degree of, of, of real personal freedom you have when the government can't dictate what your beliefs are and conversely when religion doesn't dictate what the government should be so it's it's i think that secularism is not anti-religious secularism it, it it it's not i always say it like this you know um a lot of people think that secularism is like the coach telling people how to run the plays or whatever. But in reality, what secularism is or the separation of church and state is, is much more like a referee. It's, you know, a person who sort of calls the rules as they see it and make sure that nobody's being taken advantage of, or that somebody is getting an unfair shot. That's really what secularism is all about. It's not, you know, and, and, and you know, because I'm, you know, I, but so that's what matters to me, because I think if we want to make a real change in this country and a real change in the world, we need to show what we do value, what we do care about. And for me, that's reason, science, critical thinking, human rights, um, you know, uh, ethical living and, 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 you know, liberal democracy. Those are the things I care about. I try to articulate. And I think that like, as we've sort of talked about tonight, that sort of these broad universal things can unite a whole lot of people. And the more that we do that, I think the more we'll succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And, you know, I, I, and I think the message, that message, I, I think is 
you know, and, and, and please don't, I mean, I, I'm not trying to sound like a kumbaya person because that's the farthest from the truth, but it gets- Likewise. Yeah, but, but the but the but the um, but the fathers from the truth is when you uh, when you when you think atheism is what defines you, and uh, you know, uh, and, and and I guess if you if you think that way, uh, you are entitled to it. But I call myself, and I don't don't impose this label on anybody. But I call myself what I think is being a normal atheist. Atheist. I don't try to do outrage stuff just because I'm an atheist. You know, I just try to do what is right for me and what I think, you know, and I think I got values, not because I'm a religious person, because I know the difference between right and wrong. And I try to live my my life about that. That's what I say that atheism doesn't define me because I don't know, but maybe if I were a really religious freaky person, I would have the same value. So, so that tells you that the, that, that the atheist part of me doesn't define me. But um, you know, this this uh, sharing of values, this trying to make the world a better place without sounding corny, mm-hmm. this uh, ethical, these values, all this is what should make us stronger. And I think, you know, if that is supposed to be called secular, humanist, atheist, you know, to me, use any name. Um, uh, But just don't use the name, well, you know, I'm none of those. I, I don't get involved with that because you are involved. If you live in society, whatever uh, 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 results come out of decisions related to that are going to affect everybody. They are not going to affect me because I claim to be secular or humanist or atheist. They are going to affect everybody. So, uh, you know, sometimes apathy is is a, is, a, is a huge problem. But that's that's kind of beyond what uh, what the scope of what we're trying to talk about here. But yeah, I think you define pretty much you know all these things that um, uh, could help us elevate the secular movement, uh, this kind of finding the common denominator, the common values. And I think, uh, you know, we can learn to live. The, the problem is the moral policing of the world that some people feel that they are they should be doing. That's mm-hmm. where I have the issue, you know. Yeah. Uh, that that's my issue, and that generally comes from re- religiosity. The, the the thing that comes from atheism is that well, you know, I'm an atheist, so I can do anything because I'm open. I'm atheist, and you know, and uh, to me, that's the other uh, the others the other side of the pendulum. I try to live somewhere in the middle. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm not perfect. In some issues, I might go to the one side. Some issues, I might go to the other side. But ideally, I like to kind of center myself. And some people might not perceive as that. But you know, that's that's something that you have to be looking as a human being uh, all your life. It's not something that 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 happens just because you get up in the morning. So uh, it's, it's it's you know, it's, I think right now it's a it's a, a very trying time for everybody. Because uh, we are in a, in a time where, you know, all the things that most secular people and most atheists and most humanists believe in, they right now they have a platform. So it is very difficult as a humanist, secular, atheist, non-religious person to sit idle and not say anything and not say any, and not think anything and just take it. Uh, it's just too much going on. So I think it's important right now that we we continue building a foundation. So perhaps one day, you know, we'll get to the point that you mentioned, non non-existent, irrelevant, or you know, just doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think that that's that's really one of the main goals. Is that you know, my hope is for a world in which people are either more secular. Um, and either don't hold on to religious doctrines or theistic beliefs or supernaturalism, um, and, or that it becomes a private matter, that it's something that's a personal thing that they don't let it cloud their sort of voting, doesn't allow, doesn't you know, sort of cloud their job, doesn't, you know. And the thing that always makes me very interesting, always fascinates me is that 
the the theocracy that we see around the globe, whether it's here in the United States with, you know, with uh, the Trump administration trying to get rid of the Johnson Amendment or the sort of the the, the, the evangelical caucus and, and and somebody like Betsy DeVos at education and the the curtailing of birth control rules at, at, at HHS and things like that. I always find it very interesting how uh evangelicals these sort of radical theocratic evangelicals they don't think their god is strong enough it, it's like they don't it's like they don't think their god is strong enough to actually do what they believe in that they have to have government to make it happen i, I always find that a very weird thing that just drives me crazy it's like i thought your god could kind of do anything why is it that you need help with the legislature to get what you want and it's and it goes back to what you said earlier about how you show up to an event and and it sort of becomes a revival and you're like, well, what the hell is this? Like it, it, it's, 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 you know, it, 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 they always do this sort of weaselly shit, which drives me crazy. It's like, they can't actually stand the, con- the, 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 it's like they don't have the confidence of their own convictions. If you genuinely believe this shit, why would you act so weaselly about it? And I think it's because one, they know it's, I think some of them genuinely believe it. I mean, I'm not going to say they don't, I can't pretend to read minds, but I do think some of them genuinely sort of acknowledge how bad, that shit it is and so it's very hard for them to sort of realize oh wait we're not going to get this without some sort of extra help um because the country's just becoming way more socially and culturally tolerant as we go on and evangelicals are losing power hand over fist they're they're shrinking and what we see in our government right now is sort of their last gasp but, you know Ch- trump is such a moron that they've been able to sort of convince him to do whatever the hell they want and they love it right but we're gonna have to live with the consequences of that right because because you know you know trump and and the senate have confirmed more um i think more circuit judges and and federal judges during the last couple years than you know the previous four or five presidents so they're gonna have an incredible amount of power in that regard right Mm -hmm. and again it goes back to being involved caring about the issues and and realizing like if you can speak out you need to speak out like this is not a time to sit on the sidelines if you really care about this stuff um it's time to speak out speak your mind learn about the issues and 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 really become a a a citizen you know and, and value citizenship which is something i talk about a lot um in my own life and in in my show is i talk about the value of citizenship and how you know we live in a culture that's so individualized, which in a lot of ways is good, but but it has one drawback, and that's this sort of lack of civility and lack of citizenship. And I think that's what we need to work towards. And that will help us, uh, you know, that'll take, you know, the theocrats will go away. You know, if, if you, you get more and more people, you know, people who are secular like us and even religious people who are sort of liberally religious who don't buy into the theocratic nonsense. Um, you know, if you can build bridges with them and you can get these theocrats out of office, we'll be a hell of a lot better off. And so I, I think that's really important, right? So we can have serious, I think, and, and legitimate and, 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 and justifiable disagreements with people on, on the religious side of the aisle. Right. And that's not a problem. But if they value the separation of church and state, if they value uh, uh, getting rid of theocracy, then, you know, I'll stand with them. You know, and that's and that's really the most important thing is just, you know, is, is realizing like, you know, these theocrats don't speak for they definitely don't speak for us. And they don't and they definitely don't speak for a lot of Christians either. So it's important for us to sort of, uh, you know, see the target and see the problem and make sure that we go after it because i think this is their real last chance to get what they want because otherwise the demographics are just against them and 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 so i really applaud the work that you do and the work of other people around the country trying to fight to get these theocrats out of government i really do uh, well, uh, let me tell you, we have our job cut up for us um, because I think right now that on top of all the things that you have mentioned, we have another issue and the, 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 the big problem that I see right now that we have, that we have a set of rules for Trump and the GOP and another mm-hmm. set of rules for the rest of the country. So, you know, uh, it, it is bad for you and I and other people, regular people, to even say the way abortion, but they can have mistresses and prostitutes and pay for their abortions. That's perfectly fine. Oh, you yeah. know, uh, you know, so it's a total, it's two set of rules, one for them and one for the rest of us. And, you know, when you, when you start, when you run into those problems, that becomes, that easily becomes a dictatorship 
and I'm very familiar with the dictatorship because I lived in a dictatorship for for a long time. So I see a lot of a lot of signals that that we are going through like a democratic dictatorship because we don't give up the word democracy. But there are a lot of things here that are kind of completely out of hand and totally uncharacteristic for for this country. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you touch in one very important point. The only way to reverse this process is for each one of us to get involved, to speak up, to do to the extent of our abilities the best we can to reverse this trend. Because it's the only thing that is going to save us from going down uh, on the cycle of, of, of a slippery slope that all big empires, we're not talking about the empire of the United States, I don't want to get into that, but you know, all societies go through cycles. And mm -hmm. history show us that. But you know what? Last time I checked, the difference between us and other animals is that we are supposed to think. So if we've seen if we've seen these mistakes done before, and we know that they have happened before, for the life of me, I cannot understand why we cannot avoid this cycle of slippery slope. I just don't get it. So, mm -hmm. and one thing that this country has that might separate separate it from the rest of the world is resilient but you know what now we're abusing the resilience we need to stand up and make sure that we as individuals can do the best we can to the best of our abilities and i think secularism is one of the ways to do the right thing because we are not i i, I look at secularism as some something in the middle something that is trying to you know, do that delicate navigation through through a path of uh, total uh, uh, religiosity and and, 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 and and who knows what else. And secular people are trying to do the right thing. Not we're well, not perfect. I'm not claiming that. But you know, we are trying. So I think as long as we are trying to reverse this current process at the political level, at the social level, at the uh, at, at the religious level, I think we might we might we might be successful. But if we sit there for things, hoping to get better on their own, I think we are we are for a rude awakening. Really. I I totally agree. And I think that's a great place to leave it at. The essay is Why Hispanic Women Should Abandon Religion. It'll be in the forthcoming book, Women Versus Religion, The Case Against Faith and For Freedom. That's edited by Karen Garce. And I'm speaking with Hypatia Alexandria. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, how can people uh, reach out to you? How can people contact you to learn more? Um they can I, I can give my email my email is h y p a t i a h is in henry y yellow p paul a apple t tom i india a apple at a apple r robert a apple u umbrella c charlie o oscar dot com so hypatia at arauco.com Awesome. And I will include that in the show notes as well. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you. And that's it for this, this episode of Reason Revolution. Make sure you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, the link will be in the show notes. Also, check out our website, reasonrevolution.org. All of the content is there now. All the Facebook posts, all the memes, all the YouTube content, all these new articles and things we've got going up there all the time. We've really changed the content. We've really changed the sort of focus of the site and the focus of the project. So definitely check us out reasonrevolution.org. And until next time, this has been Justin Clark, and this has been Reason Revolution. Reason Revolution.